Mm. <laughs> Let's give it one more minute. Welcome, welcome. Everybody, welcome, 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 welcome to, to the uh, regular Algo Dynamics podcast series. So, uh, monthly events, and uh, every month we invite the who's who in finance and AI. Uh, so, we've had some great speakers, and, and once again, very, very happy privilege that uh, Prof Nag's been able to join us for this session. So, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Ron John. Um, quick audio test is, it, is this working, Ron John? Can, can you hear us? Can you hear us? I can hear you. You're a bit crackly, but I know hopefully... I'm crackly. I'm crackly. You'll just, you'll just ask a couple of short questions and I'll ramble on. Is that right? I think that's the way to do it. And then a quick introduction to, to uh, Tarun joining us from uh, Canada. Tarun, quick audio check. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, loud and clear. Good, good, good. Actually, so there we go. So let's make a start. So um, the format for today is um, first half will be recorded. So it's recorded now. Second half will be audience, Q&A, participation, uh, discussions. The second half will not be recorded. So once again, the first half is now being recorded. We'll make it available afterwards on YouTube. Second half will not be recorded. So on that note, let, let me hand over now to, uh, to Ron John. Um, a lot to cover. Um, amazing backgrounds, amazing achievements, Ron John. So I, I think, you know, considering we, we only have 20 minutes, probably a, a touch of focus on, on the AI bits and the fintech bit. So Ron John, once upon a time, starting at the beginning, I think the PhD doctorate, that's probably a good place to start. So uh, Ron John, okay. take it away, take it away, take it away. Not from not from kindergarten. Yeah, no. So <laughs> thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Ron John Narg. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of Medicine, actually, at Stanford University. Um, but in the finance area, I teach uh, venture capital, healthcare venture capital. Also, I teach AI, genes and ethics. So what's my background? Electrical engineering at Birmingham University, my favorite university, a PhD at Cambridge in speech recognition, machine learning. Uh, then went to MIT to work with Professor Lowe uh, in finance, working on AI for finance, probably one of the first um, systems of neural networks for stock market prediction in 1991 um, over at MIT and then but then went to Stanford University not computer science not engineering not the business school not economics but actually uh, actually the psychology department and there we're looking at mathematical models how the brain works and really there look really got the inspiration and in these what these techniques are known as neural networks now it's often called deep learning where we're sort of looking at how to solve non-linear problems by uh, thinking of a neuron there's about 90 billion neurons in the brain and each neuron is connected to hundreds or thousands of others and can we actually create a model and so that's basically what I did in the uh, 1990s did my first company uh, doing speech and handwriting recognition no one would give me a job so i had to start companies in silicon valley uh, we sold that one to motorola second one it was crowdsourcing intelligence uh, i really invented the first mobile app store in 1999 and that got sold to rim at blackberry and the third one, I was, I was more the investor advisor as Vocal IQ, uh, doing speech dialogue systems. And that got sold to Apple. So, so one to Motorola, one to BlackBerry, one to Apple, the most famous mobile companies in each era. Uh, but the last 10 years, really looking at um, AI for finance, AI for medicine. Uh, you know, certainly I'm with Professor Lowe at MIT. We, you know, we think that medicine can actually be solved with uh, finance and uh, using portfolio theory. Medicine is very, very risky. And so how do you deal with risk? In finance, we have ways to deal with risk. It's called portfolio theory. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I'm, I've got three personas. I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach uh, uh, venture capital in the medical school at Stanford University. I teach longevity science. 
and I teach uh, AI. In fact, there's an AI course on Monday that's available to anybody. Uh, I'll, I'll post that. Is it post, the... po post, post the link actually on, on this event, Ron John, at, at the bottom of the, the event page? On yes. The that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, point. I'll do that. And then um, it'll be, um, yeah, I think there's about hundreds of people registered for that one. But it's online. You can, you can do that if you want to know more about AI. So that's one persona. The second persona, I'm a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. And I run a venture fund that invests in AI and longevity companies. Uh, and I've also got a hedge fund with the Algo Dynamics, uh, which uses AI to uh, invest in public equities. And what our objective there is to try and get S&P returns, but without the S&P volatility, without the S&P risk. Uh, so this is one of the first comments when someone says, you know, I can get you 10% return, 15% return, 19% uh, return. They're all meaningless numbers unless you know what risk you are taking. Um, if you're taking a lot of risk, maybe 10% is not a good number. If you're taking no risk, maybe 4% is an excellent number, yeah. right? So uh, that's how I uh, think about things. So Jeremy, what do you want, which direction? Do you want me to talk a bit more about algorithms? I, I or think the, uh, the portfolio, I think you, you mentioned portfolio, which, you know, it, it's topical across medicine, it's topical ac across finance. Um, I think there's one more strand, if, if you don't mind, I mean, this, you've done so much, Ron John. One more strand, you, you've got a, a, another interest, I guess, which is more sort of fixed income type return. Is that, is that correct? I, I oh, right, yes. Yeah. So Again, it's sort of, sort of risk. Yes, I risk own personal activity, no, not, not personal, but also professional. Venture capital, ultra high risk, right? Uh, but high returns, or we hope high returns. Uh, next is equities, right? Uh, it's not risk free. Uh, it depends on the performance of the underlying companies. But public equities, supposedly going concerns, Running businesses, now the stock market has a wide variation of uh, uh, risky companies. Uh, but the third one is um, really, I have uh, uh, a, a firm called PayPlant that does invoice factoring. So what that does is it goes to companies, small companies usually, who have big companies as customers. And the big company, it might be, maybe Cisco's their customer, and uh, the small company says, so, well, we're doing a project for Cisco, but we're getting money. Uh, we sent them the invoice, but they're not going to pay us for 60 days. And we need the money now to pay our employees. So we actually buy the invoice. And really, the risk is not the flaky company. The risk is Cisco paper, which is not, usually not too bad. So those are sort of thinking about how I think about risk in going back to now, what's the percentage return and what's the risk that you're taking? There are many ways to mediate risk uh so certainly uh mathematically you can start looking the mathematical uh, version of this is looking at volatility yeah. uh there's something called the sharp ratio which looks at the standard deviation of uh of, of the changes in prices and i gather you had professor sortino here uh some time yes, back yes, and he yes. you know he said well you know we've got standard deviations prices go up and then they go down well Really, we only care about when it goes down because that's when we're losing money. Uh, we don't really care when it's going up. So in standard deviation, it's taking the square of the difference. Uh, really, uh, Professor Zortina said we came up with the idea, well, let's just chop off the top bit and just look at the, vol the real risk part. And, um, and so thinking about risk mentally is, is important. And then, then how AI models can look at, if you can take data, often there's tons and tons of data uh, available to us now. Uh, but how do we manipulate that? Because things, we have what's called confounding variables uh, that may be affecting the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the return, which we don't know what's actually creating the problem. Is it that it's in May, buy in, uh, sell in May and go away, the old adage? Um, or is it just happens to be that uh, uh, in May certain dynamics are happening uh, with certain purchase orders uh, that happen in that area uh, that for, for lots and lots of companies, or there's a boom in purchase orders at the end of the year that happen. What are the confounding factors? There's a sort of causation versus correlation. And uh, one of the things in uh, AI is what we want to sort of, do, sort of delineate between causation and correlation. Many AI models are really, what they're doing is looking at correlations. 
And we really want to put a sort of a layer on top and say, thinking, well, what's what's actually causal? And the way I look at it is you have to, to decide if something's causal, you have to look at it in many, many different dimensions. Um, and there's something called the Bradford Hill test, which uh, Sir Austin Bradford Hill in the 1960s was trying to prove smoking caused cancer. And you'd see these charts, well, you know, uh, cigarettes, more cigarettes you smoked and, and the more um, cancer you got. And of course, this smoking lobby said, well, that's just coincidence, right? But they lived in London, which is smog polluted. And so you have to say, well, okay, well, it happens in Paris and, Bel and, and, and Brussels and Beijing too. Well, they're also polluted. Well, okay, well, it happens at different times as well. It's not just any, and then the, the more you smoke, the more cancer. So having that seven, eight, nine, ten dimensions is something about how to, how do you put those as inputs into your AI model? So it's not just correlating. It's actually trying to figure out if there's any causal relationship too. Can, uh, I, can, I, can I just have, it's an important one actually, Ron John, because we, we've been working on this for years, right, at Algo and, and other companies too. I'll throw in a span in the works, so absolutely, you know, causation, correlation. The span in the works, especially in finance, and, and please do comment, right, interject, uh, debate this one, um, regime switches. Uh, so we, we've had the pandemic, don't want to talk about that, but you, you can build your perfect model, you can build your perfect causation, correlation, and then you get a massive, massive regime switch. So, yes, which I think is an even bigger problem in finance. Other areas is a bit less, but that, that's that's my takeaway so far. So, any, any comments, Ron John, about sort of you know, yeah, well, the world changing, thinking, yes, yeah, world changing. But the idea is, can you actually predict the regime? Is is that is that information actually showing up in the underlying patterns yeah. ahead of the regime switch? I mean, ideally, if your AI model is strong enough, is actually seeing those dynamics um, happening all at once. Now, it could be like a I mean, like pandemic, we actually had some quite famous AI models that uh, were predicting um, a pandemic even before it was announced by the WHO uh, by just looking at uh, travel plans and social media posts and and, and, and the like. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there's an Uber model where you're sort of collecting everything. This is like the Skynet type thing. Uh, uh, but, but, yeah, that's, that's, that's very kind, Ron John. You, you, you're you doing the algorithmic sales pitch, so that, that's very kind of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, slightly leading question, but absolutely, I, I think dynamics, Ron John, you know, spot on. Uh, crowd behavioral dynamics, uh, I, I think, figuring out, you know, because they do show up usually somewhere. Uh, that's that's right. I, I mean, I, that wasn't meant to be an endorsement of any kind. It's basically, okay. can you actually uh, see it somewhere in the in the number. Now, it used to be people say, well, just see it in the prices. I don't think that's enough. I think uh, certainly looking at crowd behavior uh, as well. Uh, we all know that crowds sometimes fall, fall, fall off a cliff, though. They just follow people like sheep. And <laughs> you've got to sort of delineate um, are there people just following or are they actually uh, um, being able to uh are they actually following or is there some sort of rationale around it and that's what uh, there's so much complexity these newer ai models uh instead of doing a linear problem where you do y equals mx plus c and we don't know what m is and what c is um as a straight line uh most problems are much much more complex and that's why a lot of these ai models they have hundreds of thousands of parameters uh millions of uh, billions of parameters uh, popping up, but you have another problem as you get to these more complex problem models. Uh, that's the problem of overfitting. Well, that means it fits to your training data, uh, but when you have new data, new examples, it doesn't what we call it doesn't generalize. And so, if it doesn't generalize, then it doesn't work. Uh, and so, that's the uh, other problem. We, we see all these uh, press releases and uh, comments that. I've got 13 billion parameters. I've got 45 billion. I've got 176 billion parameters. The latest chat GP3 three, uh, model and the latest one from GPT4. I, I think it's a trillion, trillion uh, parameters. It's just not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Okay, we've got one person with a hand. We'll, up. we'll, we'll probably we'll probably leave the Q and A for part two actually, because I said we're being recorded now. So since, since we don't have permission, Ron, but um, everybody, pl please write down your questions, and we'll have a a very good long Q and A debate later on actually with with, with Ron John's power here. So, um, uh, Ron John, listen, fully agree. By the way, you know, more, more params doesn't equal equal better. I, I don't know. Maybe that's the marketing department sort of 
So is yeah, it, I think that is a marketing yeah. department. Yeah. And also, you know, I'm not sure anybody read the um, the latest announcement from uh, DeepMind about this uh, uh, this uh, or was it Google or whatever the division was uh, about the new uh, AI system that can actually do mathematics, can actually do geometry, um, and there's been a bit more. I mean, at first it's uh, when it came into Nature and uh, an article there. And then there's a lot, been some critique on that. I'm not sure if you noticed that. You know, nature's becoming a tabloid. It's just reprinting what <laughs> Google says. Um, and what they're saying was basically the type of uh, mathematics it was looking at was basically uh, systemic. The equivalent is let's try and use AI to find the formula for gravity. Well, we don't actually new, need to use AI to find the formula of gravity. You can use something called calculus and find it exactly. You don't need to drop an apple a thousand times and measure the uh, parameters uh, because it will probably be inaccurate. Uh, you can actually just calculate gravity directly and get the exact equation. Yeah. There's no need to actually use data and drop an apple a thousand times to to do it and i think that was the critique of that latest uh, mathematical exposition they were kind of doing that uh, solving something that's really solvable exactly and uh, to a hundred percent level not to 92 percent level uh which was doing oh, so it's the wrong I, i've seen i've seen i've seen more of those actually ron john and i'm throwing it out here now ready for discussion <laughs> asking your standard um chat gbt you know th three towels take three hours to dry uh, you know, nine hours, you know, how, how long does it take nine, nine towels? It, it gave the incorrect answer, but it, it gave a, a populist answer, I would say. Uh, it gave an answer of, of, of what, dare I say, you know, the average person might think. So I, I would say these, these chat bots are optimized to sound correct, to not actually be correct, Ron John. Is that, is, is, am I putting words in your mouth? Is, it, is that sort of a well, valid question yes, or not? It's, yeah. it's different to... Um numbers right it's like well yeah well, you're yeah. doing it out in the dynamics you're taking numbers and and the like so chat gpt is words now we're changing the words into numbers and um the uh but what it's doing is looking at probabilities of uh, uh sequences of words they call them tokens yeah, yeah. uh that could be coming out and so it's not actually doing any understanding uh, it's actually just coming up with the probabilities of what should work and what might work and what might be uh, appropriate. And so uh, it's actually, people think it's actually understanding. but it's actually No, but doing... it's probabilistic of, of words to make it sound, uh, dare I say, credible, I guess, Ron John. That, that's the sort yeah, of no, I mean, I think, which no, is no. great for marketing, by the way. I'm, I'm not having go, by the way. It is great marketing tool, the, these chats. So I just want to be clear. Well, I think it's yeah. the, 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 the devil's advocate approach is, well, are we as humans just doing probabilistic? presentations. I mean, am I just saying my sentences based on what I think everyone wants to hear or would be entertained by? Well, well uh, that's why we learn. have Q&A. We have Q&A discussions later on, Ron John, to counteract <laughs> that. But yes, uh, humans, God, that's complicated, isn't it? Okay. Uh, crikey, Ron John. Okay. I, I knew this was going to be a good discussion, but I didn't realize it was going to be that good. Okay. So, ChatGPT, um, finance, I think we covered that. Um, briefly, I, I think just, just going back, actually, as I said, you, you've done an incredible what you've done. Um, back in the days, and I, this was way back you know pioneering you one of the first ones the work you did with, with andrew low uh neural nets for for stock market was it ahead of time was it the wrong approach any any thoughts about your your dissertation at mit back in the days yeah, it's kind of funny because you know my yeah. first ai system was in 1983 cool. and um, wow. i thought i was late by the way when i was coming <laughs> to that field uh because you know the term was coined in 1956 and you can actually trace it back to alan turing in 1936 and so we think it's a new topic. It's not a new topic at all. Um, so my thesis with uh, Andrew Lowe at MIT was in 1991, January 91. 91. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And um, at the time, I think there's uh, sort of neural networks are going through a boom. Um, com compared to today, we didn't really have that much data. And it was sort of uh, you know, mediocre, um, moderate results. But I was probably one of the first people to actually sort of work on that topic and uh, uh, the computing power is also relatively small. I had to use a digital signaling, the digital signal processor. Um, it's a high speed chip, which by today's standards, not high speed at all. 
Uh, but so uh, it wasn't a, wasn't a regular PC of the day. It was a sort of souped up version, but probably equivalent to today's uh, computing power on your laptop or even your phone. And um, I think uh, I, th I think intuitively it came out with the right answers, which is that stock markets are nonlinear problems, and so they're nonlinear problems. They're not a simple straight line. Uh, and what I was amazed about in econometrics, nearly everyone was using basically variations of linear regression. So oh, hang on a minute, why? <laughs> it's, it's too simple, too simple a model. Um, uh, and um, uh, so this is probably one of the first of doing non-linear regression uh, across the... Uh, uh, were, 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 were you poo-pooed back in the days? Was, was this too radical or not? And, and by the well, way... Well, I think it, yeah, go for it, yeah, it was yeah. sort of in a closed window, in a master's thesis, right? And... Uh, uh, my master's thesis was after my PhD thesis, by the way. I was going backwards. Uh, but uh, it's, um, uh, uh, I think people were still not sure about it. The jury was still out, and uh, it was just me on my own. And I, it wasn't widespread. It definitely was not widespread uh, of a technique uh, for time series. It wasn't really until a few years later. Uh, actually, some of the things I did at MIT were like that, where you could handle time series. The original neural networks would look, look recognize patterns, cats, yeah. dogs, uh, letters, zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, fives. Uh, a lot of my fundamental work was looking at time series. Uh, no, so you know, certainly speech recognition, where one word follows another word. Uh, often that's a Markovian process yeah. that was used, but you can actually use uh, some things they're called recurrent neural networks, uh, or today we have now things called LSTMs, long short term memory models, uh, that you can actually, these are acronyms, but they handle time series or sequential problems, as opposed to just a fixed pattern uh, of, of, a, of a picture. And so uh, that was the, that was a more difficult um, and more, sort of cutting edge um, uh, types of algorithms of handling those types of problems. So already in, in 91, using dedicated chips for a stock market already, right? Okay, great. Yes, that's right. Already, <laughs> already. Actually, that's, yeah, now you say it, yes. <laughs> 91 <laughs> is like, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm most of your audience were born in already in 91. Everybody was born in 91. Nobody, but it's interesting, <laughs> actually. I've, I've got a comment on that, and, and, and great discussions. We'll bring on people in a second, actually. Uh, as always, you know, challenge me, Ron John. Sometimes I think in finance that they're just being a bit slow. I, I, I don't mean this in a rude way, um, but well, maybe, th think, yeah, or maybe I do. Yeah, actually, I, I don't know. Use, yeah. use what they're familiar with. They, yes. they use what they're accustomed to. And then with new stuff, they're sort of uh, on edge whether they really want to jump because it takes time to learn new stuff. So it has to really show value. Now, I think if you're students, you're supposed to do new stuff. Universities are supposed to do new stuff. So you've got a bit more of a of a leeway. But if you're working in a quant lab and you want to try a new idea, then maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's a bit more difficult. Maybe you don't have the computing power. I mean, that's why I give OpenAI its credit. It is sort of like you know, use sixteen million dollars to train its uh, its GPT three. And most people in most labs, most companies, you go to your boss and say, Oh, can I have a, buy a hundred thousand dollars of computing power? Hitherto, you'd be thrown out of the, so it would be practical, be pragmatic, think cleverer. And we had to think cleverer. And by the way, I think people are thinking cleverer. They're trying to do these things in much smaller computing loads. Uh, but now it's not such a ridiculous idea. So, okay, well, let's see how we can raise the money to do this experiment. What will we get out of it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think looking at the history of AI, people are trying to, when they come up with a computing bottleneck, they get, become cleverer. I mean, I was doing neural nets on the equivalent of an eight MIP processor, which is like oh, really that. nothing. It's like a PC 1988 kind of range. Um, but it, 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 it people, does make you disciplined, doesn't it? Uh, and yeah. It's one of those, you have to, you have no choice, I guess, right? You have to be clever. Yeah, you have to write it in assembly. You have to write it in, um, you know, do integer arithmetic. You've got to try to come up with all kinds of tricks that you don't, that reduce the computation power by an order of magnitude. Um, and even that's not enough. But uh, you know, people just get cleverer when they... Um, when they uh, have I, to, I guess, right? When there's no... Yeah. Data. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, I think I believe in Russia and places like that where in India in the olden days when they didn't have access to the computers that the West had, um, 
they came up with all these interesting you know, Tetris and things like that. that because they had rapid. no choice. That That's desperation yes. creating innovation, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. Um, we're slowly getting towards the halfway mark here, but fascinating discussions. Um, switching again, Ron John, so all around again. So different portfolios um, with your venture capital hat on, because you, you've got so many hats on. Um, I think you, you've got preference for Cambridge companies. Am I, am I putting words in your mouth? Is it for those no, reasons? No, no, no. I'm, I'm definitely not a snob. I'm definitely not a snob. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's uh, I think the laws of physics. Last time I looked, are uh, exactly the same in uh, Timbuktu as it is in Cambridge or uh, Palo Alto. Uh, in fact, it's an investment thesis. Uh, you know, you go to places where other people are snobbish about and don't look at. Now, having said that, we do have a lot of investments from the Cambridge area that's because uh, you know I go there as, as, as much and bump into more people there, probably like 20. Five percent of our investments yeah. in the Cambridge uh, area, and um, uh, the rest are in the, the US. So yeah. places we we go to, uh, and um, deep tech, deep science, tough tech, uh, really where we have to sort of roll our sleeves. And often people, a lot of investors are afraid of entering AI uh, companies or investing in AI companies or deep tech companies. Uh, because they say, oh, I don't understand it. Well, no one understands. That's why it's called deep tech. <laughs> it's called deep. <laughs> because <laughs> So the idea is then you have to sort of really roll your sleeves up and sort of think about, okay, for first principles, what's the person trying to tell us, right? And uh, it, it, you can actually uh, uh, look at things. You know, so often people say, well, I've got 15% I've got return. Well, I need to know the risk you're taking to get the 15% return to know if that's a good or a bad number. I've got 99% accuracy. Well, I need to know what your false positives are and false negatives are to know if that's a good, it may be a good number, it may be a bad number. Maybe 20% is a good number, but you've got great false. But that, that's false. from first principles again, which dare I say sometimes we, we are sometimes lacking, isn't it? So, uh, yes, it's thinking, yeah, yeah. and you don't have to check your brain in the door. If that person can't just explain it to you yeah. uh, in simple language, then maybe there's something wrong with the person and the, the idea that they've got. Uh, you, you've got to sort of think about it. The most successful scientists are those who can explain it to their colleagues uh, and to the world at large. Oh, I uh, mean, people get Nobel Prizes for one or two sentences, right, Ron John, when you think about it, which we just like, wow, okay, you just, you know explaining it yeah <laughs> well when he hits the press when he hits the press it's usually one of two oh, usually sentences. one or two sentences okay before but that, then okay. yeah i think but yeah you're, you're right i think it's uh it's uh, i mean obviously there was a lot of work around the um uh sharp ratio a lot of work around it but essentially it's a uh, relatively yeah, simple yeah but the, the, the end result is relatively simple and, and that's the beauty i think isn't it you know simplish equation you know in terms of risk adjusted returns and upside potential and all these things right so yes and you can actually realize this so right now you know what am I, i'm trying to use mathematics to come up with a vaccine and um you know using computational drug discovery and what's the vaccine for it's a vaccine for aging and so i could have said i'm using a computational drug discovery platform for epigenetic reprogramming you then your eyes will glaze over so i need to simplify the story right and so, okay, well, okay, right. That means, okay, we can stop aging and we can reverse aging. Okay, okay, how do you do that? Well, then you go into some sort of genetic signatures across multiple diseases and the like. But mathematics is such a great tool. And really, uh, I think, uh, you know, can you use it for investing, right? Can you use it to map out the other things? Other people have a different view. I, I they, they sort of evaluate the personality of the, management team and the founder and the people some people are extremely good judges of character and uh mixes of teams and that's another approach of of investing but i would say can you actually formulate that mathematically uh, and there is something mathematically going on in the brain when you're doing that interesting 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 okay we've, we've reached the halfway mark actually I, I think we could go on for hours and hours i think but i think we just need to make sure we have a interesting audience discussion actually so um quick commercial break we, we're going to bring in tarun from tarun. I, I love this technology we can just bring people in from all over the place actually tarun do, do, do you want to bring it back to earth so to speak do you want to give us a bit of context just a summary of what we're doing at algo dynamics uh what ron john is doing and everything else we're up to globally so tarun do you want to unmute yourself uh, go for it, go, go for it, Tarun. <laughs> hi, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tarun. I'm the president of Algo Dynamics North America. 
I uh, oversee and manage our North American business here at uh, Alba Dynamics. Um, firstly, a very big thank you to uh, Professor Nog for taking time out of his thank very you. busy schedule to speak with us today. Um, truly an honor and a privilege to have him on today's podcast. Um, uh, maybe I'll just sort of give you a brief overview of the different businesses that we uh, are involved with here at Algo Dynamics. Uh, we have a traditional software business uh, where we provide um, analytics for the financial markets, uh, the equities markets, the crypto markets, and the commodities markets as well. Um, we sell our software to a variety of market participants, uh, including family offices, high net worth individuals, uh, tech entrepreneurs, proprietary traders. Uh, we offer a three month uh, trial if you would like to try out our software. Uh, the cost is 3000 US and um, we provide analytics for 20 stock symbols um, if you're trading equities and uh, 10 cryptocurrencies if you're trading crypto. Um, and then we also um, have a fund partnership business where we co-launch uh, new hedge funds. Um, we're doing one with Ron John uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, and basically, um, we work with small and medium-sized hedge funds that are looking to grow and expand. Um, you can, if you'd like to find out more information about either one of our businesses, uh, or if you'd like to find out some more information about Algo Dynamics, uh, the company, um, our technology, etc., uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Jeremy or myself. Uh, you can reach Jeremy at uh, Jeremy at algodynamics.com, uh, or you could uh, email me at Tarun at algodynamics.com. And um, I guess that's about it from my side, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you, Tarun. I, I think you know it, it, it's working closely with people such as Ron John actually uh, really understanding what they want. Because Ron John, I, I think you were a bit—I wouldn't say easier, but I think you, you were quite clear what you wanted, what you didn't want, right? Which I think was quite helpful. Yes. So, yeah. Very, very helpful. No, I mean, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah, basically, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not greedy. I just want uh, S and P returns. I just don't want the S and P risk, yeah, the S and P yeah, yeah, volatility. Yeah. Um, you know, because the S and P can go down forty yeah. uh, percent, and then, uh, and then of course, uh, no, I'm then I'm starting to panic, right? And then and I that's get the out the worst wrong time. time to sell off. <laughs> <obviously, laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we need a computational model that gets us out before it hits minus. You know, even. No, minus two, minus three, fine, but minus forty. Usually, people start panic emotion. The emotion comes. The emotional in. thing is actually yeah, absolutely. And, and then, then you vice know, versa. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when it's up forty percent, you know, should you, you know, you tend to hold on a bit longer than you should, right? And uh, can you put computational uh, techniques to take the emotion out? And, and that, that's what we've done, actually. So we've been working on that. So good. Thank you. Th thank you very much for that, Tarun. Thank you very much, Ron John. So this is, we're slowly starting part two now. This this is about creating objectivity and, and making sure we, we don't just talk in our silos. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, let me just stop that one in.